Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Kirkpatrick. If you were up early this morning, you'll have discovered that it was a, a blustery start uh, to the day as Storm Ashley, I think the first name storm of the season, began to, to pass through. And it, I think there's a return visit uh, during this afternoon, but a bit of a lull uh, at the minute as we meet together. You're very welcome to Kirkpatrick this morning. It's great to see everybody here. It's especially good to see uh, David and Pam McCullough uh, and the girls back with us uh, this morning. For those of you who don't know David and Pam, David is our former assistant minister. Uh, it's about 11 years since uh, he left us and he's now the minister down in Annalong. So David and Pam and the kids, great to see you with us this morning. If you were out last Sunday night at our Being Human course, um, you'll remember that at the end of that, Graham set us a, a challenge. And that challenge was to express or to articulate uh, our gratitude uh, on a daily basis for the incoming week. Now, he set a high bar. He suggested that we should try and name 10 things each day that we're thankful for. I wonder if you were out and that challenge was given to you, how you got on uh, with it. Perhaps like me, you didn't do just so well. As the urgent demands of the week began to distract you uh, away from that. However, built into our church week, uh, each week, uh, is this time together when we come together as God's family, to come together to set aside those distractions and have an opportunity to worship him together, to express our gratitude to him, to learn about him and to converse with him. So it's an important time in the week, perhaps the most important time in the entire week when we meet together. And of course, we're going to do so We'll all be together for a bit, for a, a part of it. The children and young people will head off to the Sunday club and Bible class. Uh, and then later on, the, those in years 11 and 12 will, will head off to, to Elevate. But throughout all our time together, wherever we're going to be based this morning, may we worship together our God. And we're going to do that. We're going to begin our time together by standing and singing collectively. We're going to sing a couple of songs. We're going to sing, Come is the time to worship. And then followed immediately by Awake. Awake, O Zion. Let's stand and sing.
sung praise to our God, let's come before him now as we pray to him. Father, we come into your presence conscious of the enormous privilege we have in engaging directly with you, our creator, our sustainer, and the redeemer of all. God of all that is and is yet to be, we thank you for this amazing world in which we live, for the diversity of the whole of creation, for the different ways in which we can experience what you have made through our different senses that you have given to us. We praise you that you encounter your people in every age, in every place, in every setting. We praise you that you make no distinction between one person and the next. And as we've been thinking about here in Kirkpatrick recently, all are made in your image. We praise you for your faithfulness to those who have gone before us, your faithfulness for us today, and we trust in your faithfulness for what lies ahead for us tomorrow and for generations to come. God, your love knows no bounds and your mercy no limits. You embrace us and you offer us forgiveness and healing to all. Father, would you forgive us for the ways when we have discriminated and sought to exclude, whether consciously or unconsciously? Forgive us for the limits and conditions we set on your love, your mercy and your forgiveness. Forgive us for our lack of imagination that reduces you to simply what we can perceive. Forgive us when we take without thinking and we forget to share without counting. Father, would you fill us with your peace and your mercy? Would you free us from the destruction of our behavior and restore us to a life lived properly with you? Amen. In our Connecting Church slot this morning, Monty's going to talk to us uh, about his recent trip uh, to South Korea, uh, where he engaged in the Lausanne Conference Congress there. Monty. Thanks, Philip. Uh, first of all, boys and girls, I wonder, would anyone help me with a guess at how many countries there are in the world? Anybody have an idea of how many countries there are in the whole world? Any hands going up? Yes, shout it out. How many? Okay, right. Well, it's somewhere in between that, actually. It's 197. Uh, by the United Nations or by the online geography quizzes that I play. Um, but there are other places like Hong Kong and Bermuda and Puerto Rico that aren't countries, but they're territories and they regard themselves as countries. So there's over 200 countries in the world. And this uh, past month, I had the chance to go uh, to Korea to a conference known as Lausanne. And Lausanne is a global non-denominational gathering of evangelical leaders. And there were over 5,000 there in person and 2,000 online, of which one was Mark Welsh uh, from our congregation. And it's they came from over 200 of those countries and territories. And um, it's called Lausanne because back in the 1970s, Two well-known Christian uh, preachers and leaders, John Stott and Billy Graham, decided to get as many of the church leaders from all over the world together to see what they could do better uh, together rather than apart. Uh, and that birthed the Lausanne, in, they met in Lausanne in Switzerland. And as you can see, it has taken place every 15 or 20 years since then in Manila, then in Cape Town where Christoph was one of the Irish representatives, if those of you may remember that, in 2010. Uh, and then just this past month in Seoul in Korea. 
Uh, I was there representing IFES. There were a number of Irish people there, Ewell Mars from PCI. And the first voice I heard when I went into uh, Belfast City Airport, Oi Monte, was David McCulloch, who has said, if I'd remembered David was planning to be here this morning, I wouldn't be standing here now. Uh, but David was there, and you can talk to him about that afterwards. There was a lot of research went on uh, into the, uh, before this all happened, and there was a, a very well-researched uh, project uh, done called the State of the Great Commission. Uh, and it's been published, and if you're interested in a lot of these topics, it's worth getting hold of. It helped us to see what is the current status of mission globally. Mission used to very much be, you know, people in the West sending missionaries to other parts of the world, but that has changed. So what is the current status of that? And what are the regional trends around the world that we need to take note of? And there were a lot of findings, and I'm only going to be able to talk about two or three now. But the first one was this, that that Christianity is very definitely a global faith. There is no doubt about that. Those who say it's a Western faith, it started in the Middle East, and it is now strongest in the, uh, the, the majority world countries. Uh, and so mission is people from any part of the world going to any other part of the world to spread the gospel. One key phrase, though, that was mentioned by in, in the first talk was that simply letting people do it in their own country will not be uh, successful in bringing about the Great Commission. Jesus said, go into all the world. And that's as relevant to us as it is to folks in, in, the, in the Republic of Congo or in Bolivia or in Korea or somewhere else. It applies to all of us. It's, if you like, polycentric. We go out from everywhere to everywhere. So that was one of the things that was definitely emphasized. Uh, also, the real need that there is a hope vacuum and a trust vacuum in our world today. So how can we as people of hope and people of truth help people to be able to trust more and to hope more? And that affects things like radical politics that a lot of people, especially younger people, are turning to. Uh, the dissatisfaction with the media uh, and elements of trust that are there as to what can you believe and what can you not believe. How can we uh, share our message in, in a way that that shows that it is true and reliable and has integrity. Obviously, the one change from previous Lausanne's is just the massive change in digitalization since the last one. Uh, so um, what does that mean for mission and for evangelism and the challenges of AI? Uh, and then issues of justice and sustainability uh, and how we interact with those issues as a church. Uh, there were 25 gaps, areas where we need to do better, as the research showed that, and we were put in to collaborative tables of people from all around the world to discuss each of these gaps, which, whichever one we were, we were keen to explore, uh, and get perspectives from around the world. And just some of those, the next generation, Generation Z or Z, as they're called, some of whom are in this congregation, uh, learn differently, think differently, relate differently, have different issues? What does it mean for the gospel to be living for that generation? At the other end, there is global aging issue. Uh, you know, what does it mean for us to have a new dynamic mission to those who are maybe in their last decade or so of life as that increases throughout the world? The challenge of Islam the challenge of corruption and politics and how Christians in politics can avoid corruption, especially in many different parts of the world. And raising leaders of integrity after so many scandals. What does it mean to raise leaders who just who walk the talk? What are some of the highlights for me? Well, here are some quotes that just uh, I, I've summarized them and uh, I can talk about them later if you wish. Uh, there was an evening on the persecuted church and all was humbling all was really, um, you know, people, who, people who've been in prison for many years for their faith, telling their story. And one speaker said, a per persecution can never kill the church, <coughs> but a compromised gospel will. Persecution can never kill the church, but a compromised gospel will. And then there was a powerful testimony of a young woman who had been trafficked, uh, has come to faith, uh, shared her testimony. A lot of this stuff, of course, I can't show you photographs. It wasn't available online. But she said, I'm on a journey of forgiveness, but they need to be brought to justice. 
So her real passion to bring the people who are still harming many, many young women to justice and that her personal story being a powerful, uh, uh, powerful tool in that, in, in, in that campaign. Uh, gender and sexuality, uh, Vaughan Roberts of, of Oxford is a well-known Bible teacher. He's someone who identifies as same-sex attracted or gay as you wish, but he um, holds to the biblical position on marriage and sexuality. And he gave, again, if you want a 10-minute or 12-minute synopsis of why that issue is so important from the voice of someone on the inside, then I can only recommend his 10 or 12 minutes. It's as key a synopsis of the issues that you will find anywhere. And one of the highlights for me, one of his quotes, we need to show the better story. Why go to church to hear a dull echo of what you hear every day from the world? And he was going about the fact that we cannot just follow the world in these things. We have a better story and we have a, a, a better uh, message about how we were created and how we find fulfillment and identity. And then in the Middle East, a, a question or a quote from one of my colleagues, my body is in Seoul, but my mind and my heart is in Lebanon. Uh, and he was having to deal with daily news from his colleagues and friends as the airstrikes were hitting Lebanon. So finally, some challenges, uh, mainly unity and diversity. How can you get 5,000 people from hundreds of denominations and hundreds of countries together around a common message? Well, that's what Lausanne showed to me is that you can. We share the basic principles of the gospel with our brothers and sisters all over the world. And yet there will be challenges just as in every family, there are challenges. Uh, one of those was uh, the issue of sexuality. Not that you might think that there were people who were wanting to change and go the way that the culture is going, but in some parts of the world, there is still a very harsh attitude towards anybody who might identify as same-sex attracted. And Vaughan's message was so important in that area. East and West. Um, there were some people who still felt there were too many Western voices um, uh, up front. Uh, the praise was wonderful. The Gettys were there with their band, and a Korean band also were extremely good and great, but it meant that the Africans felt underrepresented. And in some times of the speakers and the management of the whole thing, they felt that, that the, the, the majority world voices were not being heard. So there's that challenge between the East and the West. Also between evangelism and social justice. Some of the early responses that came out from Lausanne was that we didn't hear enough about social justice. It was too traditional. It was too, it was, it was too um, you know, mono, monochrome. We need to hear more about how the gospel affects how we live in our world. And then uh, in response to that, there were other voices coming out saying, this is meant to be a conference on evangelism. Evangelism wasn't mentioned very much. It was all about these other issues about mental health and climate change and social justice. So depending on your perspective, you know, people thought that their particular interest wasn't being represented. And again, you have this uh, idea that to hold all these people together is a big challenge. And how, why is it that we cannot um, do both, do evangelism and social justice together and realize that they are, uh, you know, partners in this mission of God? Uh, and then uh, Israel, Palestine, and the Middle East. It was going on as we were there, and there were a lot of people from the Middle East there. Um, there was a controversy because one speaker in, their, in her talk, a very good talk about social justice, uh, talked about how the problem in the Middle East was, um, was, was made even worse because evangelical Christians through a certain type of theology were reluctant ever to criticize Israel. And that's true. But of course, there was a powerful lobby from within Lausanne that didn't like that being singled out. And so we all got an apology from Lausanne. And then people wanted an apology for the apology because there were things said from the front that all of us would have disagreed with. Why are you singling that one out? And there was the feeling that there was still maybe one powerful lobby here behind everything that meant that only our issues are those that really matter. And that was very hurtful to our brothers and sisters in the Middle East. And whatever we think about that issue, whatever we think or whatever we think about the politics of it, one thing we cannot ignore, and that is that our Christian sisters and brothers in Gaza and in Palestine and in Lebanon have been killed and are suffering because of what's going on there. And we need to condemn that. And so that, of course, reared its head into this wonderful gathering 
uh, and reminded us of the brokenness of the world in which we're living. But I don't want that to be a, a negative uh, last comment. I want to finish by saying God is at work. And uh, he's, he's at work through our whole global family. And just two photographs of people I met there. At the top is a young man called Alexei. He's Russian from, from, uh, from Siberia. I know him from IFES. He's no longer in Russia, so it's safe for me to do this. Uh, he's in uh, another part of the world. Uh, but he spoke out after the invasion of Ukraine, and he had to leave very quickly. Uh, and it was just great to have fellowship again with him. And then at the bottom, there is uh, Sophie and Christina, and Christina leads our IFES movement in Greenland. I've never been able to justify uh, the expense of getting from here to Greenland, so it was really nice to go to Korea to meet her. Uh, and I finally got to meet her with her friend, Sophie, uh, and they were representing Greenland in, in, this, in South Korea. And just hearing how her life was changed through the IFES movement that started there four years ago. Uh, and having been changed by that, she uh, is now starting, she's now continuing to lead that group with her friend Sophie. So God is at work, and please never ever lose your global dimension uh, and, and interest. Boys and girls, think of other countries, get interested in what's happening in other countries, get interested in what's happening in other cultures, and particularly ask what God's doing. What's the church there like? Are people free to worship like we are this morning? What are some of the challenges? And it will, it will deepen your spiritual life. So if you want to know anything more about Lausanne, um, I'm actually flying out this afternoon, storms permitting, so just talk to David McCulloch after the service. Thank you, Monty. Um, we're going to stand and we're going to sing again together. We're going to exercise that freedom that Monty has mentioned, and we're going to sing uh, the song, This is Amazing Grace. As we're singing that, this is the opportunity for the children and the young people to leave for Sunday club and Bible class.
In a moment or two, Graham is going to come and to preach to us uh, this autumn. We've been looking at uh, a, a series entitled Your Place in God's Story. We're looking at some of the big stories and some of the big themes uh, in the Bible. And this morning, Graham's going to preach to us from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 51. If you want to turn up the passage, you'll find it in your pew Bible on page 739, 739. We're starting in Isaiah 51 at verse 17 and reading through to chapter 52 and verse 12. So Isaiah 51, verse 17. It's entitled in this version, The Cup of the Lord's Wrath. Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, you who have drained to its dregs the goblet that makes men stagger. Of all the sons she bore, there was none to guide her. Of all the sons she brought up, there was none to take her by the hands. These double calamities have come upon you. Who can comfort you? Ruin and destruction, famine and sword? Who can console you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street like antelope caught in a net. They are filled with the wrath of the Lord and the rebuke of your God. Therefore, hear this, you afflicted one, made drunk, but not with wine. This is what your sovereign Lord says, your God who defends his people. See, I have taken you, I have taken out of your hand the cup that made you stagger. From that cup, the goblet of my wrath, you will never drink again. I will put it into the hands of your tormentors who said to you, fall prostrate, that we may walk over you. And you made your back like the ground, like a street to be walked over. Awake, awake, O Zion, clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor, O Jerusalem, the holy city. The uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. Shake off your dust, rise up, sit enthroned, O Jerusalem. Free yourself from the chains on your neck. O captive daughter of Zion, for this is what the Lord says. You were sold for nothing, and without money you will be redeemed. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. At first my people went down to Egypt to live. Lately Assyria has oppressed them. And now what do I have here, declares the Lord. For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule who rule them mock, declares the Lord. And all day long, my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, in that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, and who proclaim salvation. We say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, you watchmen, lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Come out from it and be pure, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. But you will not leave in haste or go in flight for the Lord will go before you The God of Israel will be your rear guard. Amen. Thanks, Philip. Let's pray together. Lord our God, as we come to your word this morning, we ask that you would 
Speak to us afresh as you spoke to your people long, long ago through the words of the prophet. Encourage us, equip us, challenge us, confront us and comfort us. And remind us afresh of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Nobody likes a wake-up call. A couple of Friday mornings ago, I got a wake-up call, a literal wake-up call. About 6.15 in the morning, my phone started to buzz. I got up, didn't get to the phone in time, redialed the number, only to be told that the fire alarm was going off down here in church. I got dressed, got in the car, got to church, and together with the 7 a.m. prayer team who were just arriving, eventually managed to figure out in my still half-asleep state how to reset the system. Now, I have to confess that I am not a morning person. So, and this is full disclosure, I'm a less than regular attender at the 7 a.m. Friday prayer meeting. But on that Friday, they got almost my full attention. (laughs) Nobody likes a wake-up call. And they come in all kinds of ways. There is that literal wake up of the alarm clock going off to remind you that you have to get an early flight somewhere. And there are the other kinds of wake up call. There are the less than satisfactory mock exam results that wake you up to how much work you really have to do before the real thing. There is the unexpected medical diagnosis that wakes you up to the requirement for a complete change in lifestyle. Nobody likes a wake-up call, but they are sometimes what we need if we're going to face reality, if we're going to make the changes that will help us. The exile in the story of God's people in the Old Testament is a wake-up call to his ancient people. And it's a wake-up call that was a long time in coming. Way back before they entered the promised land of Canaan, Moses had delivered an address to them, his final address. The last message he shared with them, and it makes up most of the book of the Bible that we call Deuteronomy. Moses reminded the people of the God who had called them out of Egypt, who had entered into this special covenant relationship with them. He reminded them of the nature of that relationship and how it was established by the laws God had given them on Mount Sinai. And he reminded them, in particular, of the need to avoid idols if they were going to continue to live in the land that he was giving them. Turning away from God to follow idols, to follow the gods of the nations, would have horrific consequences for the people and for the land. The land, he says, would be laid waste. The people would be taken into exile. And when they asked why this had happened, the answer would already be known to them. It is because this people abandoned the covenant of the Lord the God of their ancestors, the covenant he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. They went off and worshipped other gods and bowed down to them, gods they did not know, gods he had not given them. Therefore, the Lord's anger burned against this land so that he brought on it all the curses written in this book. In furious anger and in great wrath, the Lord uprooted them from their land and thrust them into another land as it is now. So they were warned in advance. And having been warned in advance, the people to whom Isaiah's message is directed now, hundreds of years later, find themselves in exactly the situation Moses had warned them about. They are receiving their wake-up call. And it's like a slap in the face to someone in a drunken stupor. Open your eyes. Wake up. 
understand how serious your situation is. But how had they got themselves into this situation? The last time we were in this series, you remember David had been anointed by Samuel as king. And unlike King Saul who went before him, David was going to be a king after God's own heart, a king who knew God and who was known by God. But he would not be a perfect king. His moral failings would be very, very obvious. He would be guilty of adultery and even of murder. His family life would be torn apart because of his behavior. And by the time his son Solomon's reign came to an end, the kingdom that David had established would be divided in two because of Solomon's unfaithfulness and worship of idols, those gods that were, had been of the, the gods of the nations around him, around them. The ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel would be invaded and scattered by the invasion of Assyria in 722 B.C. The smaller southern kingdom of Judah would survive the Assyrian threat only to be invaded and laid waste by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. In both the northern and the southern kingdoms, the worship of other gods would be a recurring theme as would the unjust treatment of the poorest people in their society. Again and again, the prophetic voices of people like Elijah and Hosea and Amos and Jeremiah would warn the people, would warn their rulers of the need to turn back to their covenant God and to His laws. Again and again, those voices would be ignored, pushed to the side as the people and their rulers hurtled down the self-destructive path of de-godding God. And so the consequences that Moses had promised came about. Invasion, devastation, destruction, defeat. God's people taken into captivity and taunted by their captors to sing the praise songs of Zion while they sat in chains by the rivers of Babylon. It's a terrible, desperate plight. It's almost like they're right back at the start. Like the last 1,500 years in their history have all been for nothing. Their great ancestor Abraham had been called out of that very region, the region of Babylon. And now they had been forcibly returned to it. Not only that, but Babylon represented the heights of human pride and defiance against God. Babylon takes its name from the rebellious and pride-filled tower builders of Babel. And in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, Babylon will represent hell on earth. It's a disaster. And so in Isaiah 51 verse 9, just before our passage this morning, the prophet gives voice to the people's despair, addressing themselves to God, and they say, awake, awake arm of the Lord, clothe yourself with strength, wake up God. Where are you? Can you not see the state we're in? Do you not care about your people anymore? Do you not care about those promises you made so long ago? Do you not remember Moses, the Exodus, all that you did? Wake up. Do it again, God. Bring your promised salvation. And what is God's response to His people? It's you who need to wake up. You are the ones who need to wake up to who I really am. 
You need to wake up to the nature of the covenant relationship I established with you. You need to wake up to reality. You need to wake up to my overabundant mercy and grace. They need to wake up. They need to remember that this is the God who took the most unpromising of couples, Abraham and Sarah, and made them parents of a nation. Do they not think that he can do something amazing with a small, faithful remnant of people in exile? Of course he can. This is the God who's already shown that from the most desperate of situations in Egypt, he can rescue his people. Do they not believe that he can bend the rulers of of Babylon and Persia to his will? Of course he can. This is the God who reigns over the whole earth who promises redemption and restoration on a scale that is mind-blowing. Do they not believe that he will see his purposes achieved in spite of their disobedience, in spite of their faithlessness? Of course he will. Wake up. Hear what this God says. Wake up and see what this God sees. Wake up and see what this God does. What does this God say? Wake up and hear what this God says. He commands you. He commands his people. If we go back to the previous slide, Paul. He commands his people to get back up on their feet again. In verses 17 to 23. Get up on your feet. Wake up. The picture here is of a nation in a drunken stupor unable to move, unable to think or see clearly, unstable and unaware. And the cup that has placed them in that position is the cup of the Lord's wrath. They've consumed the consequences of their de-godding of God. They've experienced the trauma of His judgment to the point that they're utterly incapable of doing anything about their own situation. And at this desperate point in their lives, God says, get up on your feet. Stand up. This would be unbelievably cruel if it weren't God saying it. Imagine a bully encountering someone on the street here in Ballyhackamore who is so drunk that they don't know where they are, they don't know how to get home, and they can barely stand up. Imagine that bully telling them, get up! Imagine him taunting them, teasing them, laughing at them, as they stagger around, attempting to walk in a straight line. We're throwing something at them, knowing that uh, they can neither catch it nor duck out of the way. That's what this sounds like. Is God a bully? Is He taunting, teasing, mocking His people as they stagger under the influence of this cup of wrath? No. Absolutely not because the cup has been taken away. The cup has been removed. Not because they deserve it, but purely because of His grace. And because the cup has been taken away, the cup that had caused them to stagger and stumble, God can command them to stand up, to walk, to be restored to sanity and to hope. And so he says to them, stand up. It's over. It's time to get on your feet again. Because they need to wake up and see what God sees. He doesn't see a ruined city and a defeated people. He sees a holy city and a people clothed in splendor, the beginning of chapter 52. At this point in history, Jerusalem, the city, is a ruin devastated by Babylonian armies, laid waste by the invader with the ruling elite removed to serve in Babylon and other imperial cities. When a return eventually happens, it's a return to a city that is in bad shape with a temple in ruins and no walls to protect them from their many enemies. These days, we don't need to use our imaginations to picture a devastated 
city environment. We just need to remember the last pictures we've seen on the news from the Middle East. But beyond the rubble and the rags, what God sees is his people. The people he called, the people he rescued, the people he chose to represent him to the nations. And now he calls them to be who they really are. They are the people with whom he made a covenant. They are a light to all the other peoples, pointing them to God. They are the citizens of a different kingdom, ruled by God. Show them who you are. Show them what I see. And if they're going to see themselves as God sees them, they need to shake off their chains and get on their feet again. No more sitting weeping by Babylon's rivers. Get up. You've been redeemed. Over generations, they've sold themselves into slavery to idols. In exile, they're once again held captive by a foreign superpower. But now, God has acted to buy them back out of slavery once again. Get up. Get up. You have good news to share. Your God is not defeated by the gods of Babylon and Persia. Your God reigns. And he alone will break your chains and bring you peace and hope and joy. There's a tremendous image in Isaiah 52, 10 that sums up how all this will come about. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Or to use Eugene Peterson's version from the message. God has rolled up his sleeves. All the nations can see his holy, muscled arm. Everyone from one end of the earth to the other sees him at work doing his salvation work. The exile is not a sign that God has given up on his salvation purposes. He had started a process with Eve back in the garden when he promised that her seed would crush the serpent's head. He had continued that process through the call of Abraham and Sarah, through the exodus from Egypt, through the anointing of David. The exile is not a sign that God has finished or has given up. He's just getting started. He's rolling up his sleeves and he's getting to work. He's redirecting his righteous anger against sin. He's restoring sinful, rebellious people and clothing them in his righteousness. He's setting people free from captivity to sin and death and hell. And his work will culminate at the cross of Jesus Christ. The next section in Isaiah, read it when you go home. It'll not be unfamiliar to you, I'm sure. It will take you to that cross. Hundreds of years before the event, Isaiah will show the people exactly what it looks like when God rolls up his sleeves and gets to work. And it looks like the cross. It looks like a suffering servant who will give himself for the sins of the people. And the song of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 points us to the one who takes our pain who suffers in our place, who redeems us from our sin. It will direct us to the one who is pierced for not his own transgressions, but our transgressions, who is crushed for our iniquities, our wrongdoing. It will reveal to us the one through whom our self-determined rebellion is ended, through whom our self-inflicted wounds are healed, through whom our self-directed wanderings in the wilderness are redirected to bring us home. So what's the wake-up call for us today? What's the wake-up call for us? Not in exile in Babylon, but here in Ballyhackamore. Do we need to wake up to see the reality of who God is amidst all the competing voices and images that our culture throws at us? 
Do we need to wake up to the reality that his name is unchanged? Do we need a reminder that he is still the great I am, the covenant God, whose faithful character remains unquestioned as the holy, living, compassionate, gracious, and ever faithful God? Do we need to wake up to that reality again? Do we need to be woken up to the reality that he's still the sovereign Lord who sits on the throne of history, who reigns over all the nations, however much noise and violence and destruction and havoc they might wreak on the earth? Do we need to remind ourselves that he has rolled up his sleeves? That he has subverted the power games of princes and presidents through the death and resurrection of Jesus? Do we need to recall or be reminded that the lamb who was slain is also the lion of Judah who sits on the throne of history? Do we need to wake up afresh to the knowledge that at the cross he achieved redemption for all nations, all peoples, from all the world to all the world, Do we need to wake up to a world that needs to hear that good news that God really does reign? The creator of heaven and earth, the holy and compassionate one, the crucified and risen savior is the one who holds all things together, who will make all things new. Do we need to wake up afresh to that reality? And do we as followers of Jesus need to be the wake-up call our culture needs? As our culture all around us chases after popularity or pleasure or power, do we need to be the people who awaken others to the emptiness of it all? Who point them to the fulfillment that is only to be found in Jesus Christ? Is that what he calls us to be? Is it time for us to wake up? Is it time for the church to be the wake-up call our culture needs? Is it time to point those around us, wherever we are, to find liberty and life, peace and purpose in Jesus? Nobody likes a wake-up call. But Isaiah and the other prophets give us a wake-up call we cannot afford to ignore. Wake up. It's a new day. Wake up. It's time to come home to the one who loves you and who gave himself for you. Will you wake up today? Let's pray. Lord God, awaken us. Awaken us to who you are and what you've done. Awaken us to the calling that you've placed on our lives. Awaken us and give us strength to live out that calling in our world. Send us, O Lord, in the knowledge that your mercy and your grace are sufficient for all of our needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing together the song, Your Grace is Enough.
some announcements to share with uh, our church family, and, and the first is one that I shared already in the, the church newsletter, uh, and so you, most of you will know this already, that one of our oldest members, Stanley Mills, uh, died on Thursday evening. Stanley was a lifelong member of Kirkpatrick. He was a much-loved and very highly respected elder in this congregation. He was also a devoted teacher uh, and leader of Sullivan uh, Upper Scripture Union, through which he encouraged generations of young people to follow Jesus Christ. Much more will be said uh, at a Thanksgiving service, which is to take place here in church uh, on Saturday, uh, that's the 26th, Saturday coming, at 12.30 p.m. But for now, our prayers are with Alison, Nicola, and Fiona, his daughters, uh, as well as with Morris, his brother and sister-in-law, Ida, and the whole family circle. I know you'll be praying for them throughout this week. One of the uh, organizations that Stanley started in Kirkpatrick was the Friendship Club, and Friendship Club meets this Tuesday at 3 o'clock. Uh, when they will be having a guest speaker from Prison Fellowship, and I'm sure will also be uh, remembering Stanley. On Thursday evening uh, at 8 o'clock, we're having our prayer time together as a whole church family. I encourage you to come and make the time for that Thursday evening at 8 o'clock. We will be focusing on our church family's witness uh, and discipleship in our prayer time together. So please do come uh, and be part of that as we learn together, grow together, pray together, listen for God's voice together. And then next Sunday evening, uh, if you're not making off on a half-term break, uh, or if you're, uh, too, if you're not too exhausted after the church youth weekend, which is also happening next weekend, uh, please come and join us for uh, an evening of praise and prayer here at seven o'clock. Dan Hayes, uh, and, uh, and it says here, musical guests, will lead a time of stripped back worship of singing uh, and with plenty of space for prayer and reflection. So that's seven o'clock here uh, in church next Sunday evening for praise and prayer. We're going to continue in worship now and we're going to lift our offerings. If you're visiting with us or you're here for the first time, you're under no obligation to contribute to the offering. But as we do that now, we're going to sing together the goodness of God.
we come to our prayers for others, we're going to remember uh, the Mills family. We're going to remember uh, different situations in our world and give thanks and pray again for the work of the Lausanne uh, movement. Let's pray together. Lord, our Lord, you rule over heaven and earth. You alone see the end from the beginning. You're the almighty, sovereign Lord of every nation, whether they recognize you or not. Before you, every ruler, every prime minister, every president will one day bow. You're the all-seeing, compassionate, gracious God who knows all about our suffering, all about our pain, and who sees the least of these who suffer the most in our world. You call us to go into all the world with the good news of Jesus. You call us to share your love and your compassion with those from all nations and cultures and peoples. And we thank you for the work of Lausanne. We thank you for the vision of people like John Stott and Billy Graham to bring the world church together to consider your calling. And we pray for those who have been in Seoul over these last days and for those who return home to all the various contexts and situations in which they find themselves, that they will go encouraged with the good news of Jesus on their lips, with the desire to build up the church in his name. You know each one of us, and you know our weaknesses, our struggles, and our sorrows, and you're close to the brokenhearted. Be close to all who sorrow today, especially draw near to the Mills family as they grieve the loss of a so much loved and respected father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. In the midst of grief, may they be comforted by the sure and certain hope that is ours in Christ. We thank you for the legacy Stanley leaves in this congregation and the lives of generations of young people impacted by Sullivan Scripture Union. We know that there are many in our world who grieve and are heartbroken today as loved ones are taken from them through violence and war. We pray for those who long for hostages to be returned, that the will to find a way to return them might be found. We pray for those who do not know when death will rain down from the sky, whose lives are filled with anxiety and fear. We long for peace to come, for safety to be established, for terror to end. And we pray for world leaders that they might find new ways to protect the poorest and most defenseless peoples, that they might make humanitarian aid an absolute priority among all the other agendas that dominate their discussion. We pray for those in our world seeking power, and in particular those seeking power in the United States, that in these final days of election there will be a seriousness of approach, a recognition of the scale of the problems facing America and the world, and a demonstration of genuine leadership. We pray for church leaders who have to deal with congregations and communities at risk of increasing political polarization. And we pray that whoever wins will surround themselves with wise counselors, like the prophets of old, who are prepared to speak truth to power. We pray for our own members of parliament in Westminster as they consider assisted dying legislation in the next few weeks. We pray for a recognition of the essential dignity and worth of every human being in every circumstance. And we pray that those who will speak out for those who have no voice will be heard. And in our prayers, we bring everything that we share together in the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Conclude our service as we sing together a hymn of hope, a hymn of comfort, a hymn of strength. Christ, our hope in life and death.
we share in the words of the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen.